Welcome back and thanks so much for staying with Sunrise Live on Ear. As we have it every Monday morning, we take a look at news that made headlines over the weekend. Joining us for our weekend newspaper review is Varashni Pillay. She's the deputy editor of the Mail and Guardian Online. Good morning, girl. Good to Hi, see Cindy. you. You too. Good to have you. Let's just get into it. Uh, the Friday edition mm -hmm. of the Mail and Guardian. Uh, what's this? Lease fleece, how to rip off the government. Indeed. Almost a dummy's guide. We hope we're not inspiring too many tenderpreneurs out there. But <laughs> basically, Cindy, what's happened is before uh, last week, nobody had really heard about Mseba Faku until he called for the Herald to be burnt down after the elections. Now, what this did was turn a spotlight on some dodgy practices that Mseba Faku was doing, whereby he was buying buildings for a certain amount, getting huge overblown bonds from the bank, and then, you know, well, not him, rather, sorry, his, his former business partner, mm -hmm. through him, allegedly getting these buildings and huge overblown bonds, and then being guaranteed that the state would pay back using public funds. Now, this is a scam that is being run a couple of times, a, a couple of high-profile cases, the biggest one being Rushabangu, mm -hmm. with the police headquarters in both Pretoria and Durban. It seems to be the latest thing on how to fleece government money. Yeah, because the one thing that we would always uh, ponder on is, what is the transgression? Is it illegal? And is it something that is punishable by law? And if you look at the various players here, mm. obviously somebody from the bank would have to sign off on this it's inflated exactly bond. It. And then obviously somebody from government is going to have to approve a tender of that particular amount for building uh, that is three times more in, in rental than what it is uh, to, to actually buy it. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you know, it's, it's the taxpayer that suffer at the end of the day. For instance, with the police department, they're renting per square meter double what the surrounding buildings would have cost. Yeah. And I think what she brought up now about the banks is the key thing here. In the Mail and Garden story, we're seeing that banks like Investec are almost encouraging this kind of thing. They're all too eager to fund these huge overblown bonds um, because it's a guaranteed profit for the bank. And that's mm. the concerning part here, really, is that there's a number of players doing these things, not just corrupt officials. Yeah. But, uh, and, and then what is the penalty? Is, there, is it something that is punishable? Well, you know, we've seen that um, the public protector advocate, Tuli Madonsela, has been really firm about these things. She hasn't quite mm -hmm. gotten to Faku yet, but she has released a damning report on, um, you know, uh, Police Commissioner Tselia's uh, headquarters in Pretoria and in, you know, she's working on one about the one in Durban. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happened is that we've seen the Sunday, um, I believe it's Sunday Independent, reporting yeah. that Public Works Minister Gail Mathangu in Kabinde is in talks with Tuli Madonsela after almost three months of having this report about these police headquarters with, that were, you know, allegedly corruptly gotten from mm -hmm. Lusha Bangu. Three months later, I saw um, an article in Sowetan Live calling her the slowest reader from Zanzi. Mm -hmm. You know, how long does it take her to read this 92 <laughs> page report? Yeah. But um, now she's come out with um, a very brief, but her statement, 148 words only, saying on um, this past weekend that she's that she's in meetings with Modern Seller. Now, what's concerning about the statement is that it appears that the, her department is drafting their own report. And um, constitutional law expert Pierre de Foss says in the Pisan Independent that it's a bit concerning. It seems like they're going to try to take, find issue and find faults with Madame Sela's report and try to undermine it and undermine its findings. Mm. And that's the real concern here. It really undermines constitutional um, office of the public protector. And it also doesn't do wonders for public confidence no, in the way not. state institutions are run. I mean, the one you were referring to was the public works uh, uh, agreement also mm. in Durban for some rid ridiculous rental. Why is it that council can't just buy buildings where that, that they need for administrative purposes. Well, I mean, because of the huge amounts of profits involved, um, Rusha Bangu got a certain amount for the building, I believe in Pretoria, but the bank gave him 100 million extra. He profited mm. a cool 100 million just from that transaction. Um, in our story, we showed how um, the family of, of, of Judge Mosaneke, who previously have been found to be running these kind of schemes, have released a whole business plan around this. It's yeah. that lucrative. They have actually codified this kind of practice, and they've you know, found loopholes to get away with it. The, 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 the dodgy thing here is that there has to be a politically connected individual to make it work. Mm. So that's the problem. Yeah, we always, I mean, we, we torn between what, what is ethical, what is morally correct to do. Mm. And then on the one hand, we are in an open uh, capitalistic market where people can do certain things if you find uh, uh, loopholes. A case in point would be the tolling system that is mm. uh, under scrutiny at the moment. But let's just look at the Sunday Times, poor Shabir Sheikh. I know. He is minding his own business. Allegedly. Allegedly, <laughs> on, the, on the golf course. And there's a group of men who were defaming his dear friend, President Jacob Zuma. 
and subsequently called Shabir Sheikh, uh, and I'll quote, a Kafir lover, end yeah. quote. And, and he stood up to this. Well, this is what Shabir Sheikh says. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not debating it, but what's interesting is that this is a man who was very close to our president at, at, some, time, you know, at, our president at some time of his campaign and has now been cut loose, hung out to dry. In March this year, um, the president's spokesperson said that Zuma hadn't seen Sheikh since the inauguration. And there really is a, you know, a clear thing here that he's kind of distancing himself from Sheikh. Yeah. So it's hard not to see this as maybe an attempt by Sheikh to get himself back into the president's good books, looking, going, you know, here I am, president, still fighting for you, still yes. taking blows for you. But, but also the presidential pardon was something that one would have thought, if it's a very good friend of yours, mm -hmm. you know that he had the best mm -hmm. intentions, he might have been misunderstood yeah. um, and, uh, you know, implicated in other shady dealings. But because you're my friend and I know you for that long, I will pardon Pardon you. I mean, is that ever going to happen? That's definitely what he was hoping for, but it looks increasingly less likely to happen, especially after the president, the presidency came out saying, you know, the president isn't really close to him anymore. Mm. I mean, there was the very controversial medical parole for a supposed terminal illness, and that caused such an uproar that I feel that the presidency has almost distanced itself from helping Sheikh yeah. any, anymore. Is this the beginning of the end for Sheikh? I, c I keep wondering why. I mean, this is the second incident we've seen at the same golf course where he's been um, in an altercation. Before it was with a journalist mm. that he... Um, a female journalist. A female journalist that he slapped around. Um, in March, I believe, he was, you know, um, in another in another fight with a man at, at the mosque at his local mosque. So he really does seem to be unraveling quite rapidly. It's a bit sad to see, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. The story around Judge President Chope mm. must go. Rampela, Rampela, of course. Um, uh, voicing her, her, her opinions and, and dissatisfaction. And she's, I mean, of course, a very respected woman. Yes. It's hard not to sit up and take notice when someone like that comes out. And what she is, ta she's talking on behalf of um, an organization, I've just forgotten its name, but um, it's full, that's right, Freedom yeah. Under Law, which is sort of an, uh, an organization that works for, you know, for, for legal matters and to, and to keep con the constitution intact. And um, they've brought an application against Lopez. I mean, it's a, it's a long running thing after he was, um, you know, he took a whole bunch of the, of the of, of judges to court saying that they had impugned him and he called them a whole bunch of names. He he maintained that they were malicious, that they were doing it because of political ends. And what Rampele is saying is that this goes against the code of con conduct for judges. You shouldn't bring the justice system or other judges into impunity. You shouldn't, you know, malign them. It really mm. does mess with confidence in the ju in the justice system, which is absolutely critical for a democracy. Yeah. And it seems that um, Chlopia just seems to be going for it, um, trying to tear down all his enemies without thinking about the large, larger system and the larger issues at stake. But, but that's the thing. I mean, the temptation is there to bring everything out mm -hmm. uh, in, in, under uh, public scrutiny because you may feel uh, there's a personal vendetta against mm -hmm. you or for whatever reason. And then in the same breath, we're also calling for the uh, secrecy bill or the information secrecy bill. I, I mean, where, where does it end? At the end yeah, of I mean, I, and this is really the thing. I I mean, there's a few, there's a few people, or well, quite a few people, fighting to keep our democracy on, on, intact. And one of them is Rompere, and uh, along with her, um, the chairperson of full, um, former Constitutional Court Judge Johan Krichler, and they have brought this eight-page um, affidavit against Lopez. So let's see how that goes. Yeah. It's, it's not the first time full has brought a, a separate um, affidavit a few a, a while back, and the appeals court found in their favour. So we'll have to see how this one goes. All right, and another one is all the prodigal sons and daughters, <laughs> you know, with their tails between their legs, it's marching embarrassing. back to the ANC because, mm -hmm. well, COPE is just, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's COPE. The least said. What can we say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, and th this is quite an ironic little piece about um, Zuma's new recruit, as the Independent has called it, Anela Amda. He seems to be heading back to the ANC, and not just the ANC, he seems to be heading for a plum job in the presidency. Now, of course, no one's commenting yet, but mm. what people are saying is that the ANC are using lucrative state jobs to help further dissolve their once upon a time threat, COPE. Mm. Um, and now, what this article actually says is that. You know, there's a couple of other COPE high-profile members who've headed back to the ANC, and there's some speculation that perhaps Shaloa will be next, something he's firmly denied, but it's hard not to believe, given that he's been so adamantly against coalitions with other parties besides the ANC. Yeah. Now, if we, if our memory serves me correctly, Anela was quite uh, critical of, course. of the president to I say I mean, this is least. the biggest about turn we have yet seen. She once said that if Zuma became president, the country would institutionalize rape, legalize it. I mean, that is one hell of a statement. Her party made her apologize for it. But clearly it was no skin off Zuma's back because he seemed to have won in the long run. Yeah, because the ultimate goal, as you were saying, was to dismantle and nullify all the opposition. Mm. Uh, and even if it means taking back those that were your worst critics. Exactly. The Malema and uh, the ANC Youth League Very interesting. battle for uh, uh, leadership there. It, well, it will all unfold on the 16th of June in the 24th conference. Yeah. But it seems like Lebohang Maile's... Uh, um, 
campaign is really gaining momentum? Well, it would appear so. It's, it's hard to tell. A lot of people are quite doubtful if there is anything, any kind of steam left in this um, particular engine. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one point, Mayele looked like a very strong candidate, but now it's not so sure. I mean, this, this letter that has been leaked kind of plays on all Malema's downsides. It, it talks about his indiscipline, about his, um, you know, the, the crazy statements he makes and how, you know, the issues of youth have been sidelined. Those are all very good things, but I doubt that he's going to get enough traction in the youth league to win the majority that his campaign is hoping to win. Yeah. I think a lot of people in the country would like to see that happen. And Mayele seems to be a bit more of a, um, a, you know, a more sophisticated leader, if we could say it that way. Yeah. And people perhaps want to change from Malema. But, um, you know, in fact, I happen to be friends with, um, with the spokesperson. What's his name again? Um, and um, I, I know the MEC. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 well, no, Malema spokesperson yeah. on, on Facebook. And in fact, one of uh, Malema supporters said, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Maya can be, the, can be the, the president of the city press. Has um, it Floyd? The uh, yeah, Floyd. Yeah. Floyd. Um, Malema will be, will be president of Youth League and Maya can be president of the city press because the city press is reporting this. Yeah. So there is real doubt in the NC Youth League that Maya's campaign will come to anything. But they're hoping for at least 55% to wrestle control of the Youth League. All right. And just very quickly, uh, why Mandela went to Gunu? Yeah, indeed. I mean, this is quite a macabre story. Um, it turns out that the three bodies of Mandela's children were um, exhumed and reburied, removed from his homestead in Kunu to mm. Mvezu, which is where he was born. This seems to be part of some internal battle being run by Mandel Mandela, which is um, Osweli Velile, as he calls himself. He's now the, the chief of that region, to kind of bring more and more of Mandela legacy to Mvezu. And, you know, with that comes a lot of state funding for roads. And, but what's concerning about this is that um, in a pre preliminary organizing report distributed to media by a government in the event of Mandela's death, it said that you know, funeral arrangements would be made at Kunu. Hmm. And now it appears with you know, these, these... Everything is turned Yeah, that it's been pulled to Mvezu. It's, it's a bit of an internal battle that's quite macabre for hmm. us to witness. All right, Vareshni, as always, good to see you. You too, Sandy. Thanks, thanks so much. We're speaking to Vareshni Pillay, Deputy Editor or Deputy Online Editor for the Mail and Guardian, working us through the weekend papers in case you didn't have a chance to squeeze through them. We'll take a quick ad break. We'll see you then.